Jesse, before we begin anything today, I want to ask you, what have you eaten today? So today I was a bad Catholic. Um, it is <laughs> it is Lent, but I had a chicken salad sandwich and I have a pear that I'm saving for dessert. And as you can see, I'm showing my pear. Oh, nice. Now, now that just for people who are listening, that was a uh, pear, the fruit, not Jesse's pear. Exactly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. How about you? What have you eaten today? Well, you know, it's still early here, but I begin every morning with eggs, avocado, and maybe some sausage or bacon or something like that. I'm a low carb, high protein guy. And so my breakfasts are pretty much the same every day. Cheese, eggs, and avocado just about every day with a lot of coffee. Very nice. That, yeah. that sounds delicious. And what about you? Uh, has food played an important role in your life? Yeah, some would say too much. I, I, I've been a man of size all my life. I really came to understand that in a lot of ways, I think like many people, I have a healthy, unhealthy relationship with food. Um, oh, yeah, sure. The idea that your first meeting at 9 a.m., you're already thinking about what am I going to eat for lunch? I grew up in a Southern family and, and you equated, you know, food with love and your mom making cakes or candy on a Sunday afternoon when it's raining and we're watching football or doing, you know, a big old pot of pinto beans with a pan of cornbread. So one of the things that I was surprised about that I, I didn't realize this didn't happen with most households or at least some is, you know, my mom probably made fresh either cornbread or biscuits five, four or five days out of the week, mm. you know, just, just, there was always fresh made cornbread or biscuits, you know, as part of your meal. So me being a chef, I have to follow up on this. Uh, yeah. Did your mom put corn kernels in the cornbread and was it served with butter and honey? So sometimes she did make what she would call Mexican cornbread with a grain of corn, but normally it's just your standard you know, cornmeal, yellow cornbread with not honey, but butter. Okay. Now with biscuits, often that would be dessert that you would get a biscuit, split it in half, put peanut butter and syrup on it and eat it almost like a pancake. And that oh was my. dessert. And so mom being a Southern girl, what part of the South did you say? So I, I grew up in a, I was born in Leesville, Louisiana which is right next to Fort Polk, uh, the military base, where a lot of young men went through there. The infantry went through there on their way to Vietnam. Uh, so uh, my grandparents owned a dairy farm in uh, Rose Pine, which is just a little bit south of Leesville. It, the biggest city is Lake Charles. So if you picture Louisiana as a boot, it's in the heel. Um, so growing up in, on a dairy farm, we, we drank raw milk, oh, you know, nice. non-pasteurized milk. You learned very quickly <laughs> you needed to shake the milk <laughs> or else you're going to get a cup of cream. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, and uh, did a lot of, you know, a lot of fresh vegetables that they grew themselves. Um, we ate, I did not realize liver was a bad food because it was just something else we ate because they slaughtered their own calves and pigs. And they did a lot of this that you typical country self-sufficient. I think that eating organ meats is, is extremely healthy. And I think that, you know, only us rich first world yeah. nations, the rich countries are the ones who don't eat organ meats. And they're, they're the most healthy for us more so than the muscle meat. Yeah. And the other one of my favorite memories uh, of coming to do with food is a couple. One, when they would pick all the green beans or the or the English peas or purple hull peas, you know, they would grow them and they would pack them and they'd be in just huge wash tubs. Mm -hmm. And so you would sit on the porch at night shelling peas and, you oh, know, nice. just putting and throwing there and you everyone would be on the porch together telling stories and laughing and joking and that was always a 
beautiful memory. The other was um, once a year, there the hay field would be cut and the hay would be baled because you needed that for the dairy farms for the winter. And so you would go out, it's usually in the fall, it's still incredibly hot. This field is filled with hay bales and the guy who did it, they would, I, I can still remember his name, uh, Silas McGee. I had a huge crush on his daughter, Joanne, but they would always complain that Silas wanted, because he would charge by the bale, the machine. And for those of you who aren't sure, you know, hay is this long picture brown grass and you cut it and then a baling machine goes and puts it in that bale that you get and they were there's now big round bales but back then they were rectangle and then you would have to pick up the bale put it on the trailer and then unload it into the barn and silas because he was charging per bale would pack it as heavy and as thick as you can and my uncle would be like you know silas we'd pay a little bit more money if you made it just a little lighter and easy for us to pick but you would spend all day and by the end of the day, you are covered in sweat, you're covered in hay seeds and, and this hay and this dirt, and you would go shower and just watch the dirt, you know, rinse off you into the bathtub and then freshly showered in clean clothes, you would go and grandma would have had this feast that she had been cooking all day because everyone was going to be starved after cooking all day. Like you probably, if you had stopped for lunch at all, it might be for just a sandwich. And so um, I remember that just being so hungry and just that joy of all this homemade food that grandma and everyone had been working on. What a great reward that is to work all day and then have this great feast ready for you later. Yes, absolutely. A couple of other things come to mind. How come it took America so long to be able to make bales of hay round to where they could be rolled much more easily transported than in those rectangular things that were just crazy? Now, on, as, a, as a kid, a round bale does not help you build a fort. That True. was one of the things we would do. We would go to the barn. We would adjust the hay. And, you know, you would, you know, you'd build a fort, you'd sit there on top of all the bales, you know, telling stories and laughing and joking with your cousins. Uh, yeah. And but you're right. It is just so much more practical to have that big ball of hay right? that you could it could roll and move and easier to store. Just guy to guy. Did you ever consummate your crush on Joanne, your friend Silas's daughter? I did not. Um, oh, I did not. It was just, it was, it was, uh, never was that time. I was way too young. <laughs> uh -huh. I was like maybe, you know, 11, 12 or 13. Uh, so no, no, unfortunately, um, Joanne, if you're out there listening, I, uh, I adore you and, uh, we should get together and just visit. Um, I am sure you're very happily married as I am. I did just have, and I, I never was able to, um, consummated as you put it but uh just recently a few years ago was my 40th high school reunion and i ended up seeing sarah goings john and sarah was my first high school crush i just adored sarah she had no interest of in me as anything but a friend um she was able to somehow keep away from whatever you know my puppy dog you know affection so and just friends, not friends with benefits. Exactly. Kind of and okay. um, she was, uh, I, I worked, I wrote for the high school newspaper and she was the editor. And uh, when we saw each other at, reunion, at the reunion, you know, she, she came up to me and she said, you know, I follow you on Facebook. I said, yeah, I follow you too. You're, you and I are the same. We're not like those people. And and because it's so deep south, it's very red politically. And, and Sarah was like, you and I are more liberal leaning. And uh -huh. we had such a wonderful time. And the reason I'm bringing her up is uh, a couple of weeks ago, 
um, her son posted that she had passed away. She had died of cancer. Oh, and this was like two days after my father, uh, my brother had died of wow. cancer. And so it was a one, two punch that one of my oldest friends that I adored um, and losing my brother at the same time. So yeah, never was able to date Sarah, but was uh, remained friends on and off for, you know, over 40 years. It's fun to talk about the ones that got away. Absolutely. And, you know, Linda and I have been married. We started dating in 1980. We've been married. Uh, we got married in 84. We are still together. Um, so I have no regrets, but it is every once in a while you think about roads not taken. Oh, yeah, sure. Why not? How could you not? You, you're flesh and blood. You're a man. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so how often throughout your life have you taken advantage of having a famous name, Jesse Jackson, and what kind of things have you been able to do with the name? I thought about, and I never did this, but um, there was a story a few years ago, actually longer than that, probably 30 years ago, but a, a radio morning host, radio host named Ron Chapman was bragging to his people and other radio host that he has an incredible engagement with his audience and he said you know like when we ask people to send in credit you know send in postcards we get you know thousands and he says in fact i bet i could have i could tell my audience to send me 20 bucks and i would get i would get over a thousand dollars and people are like, no, no way you'll do that. And he goes, okay, I will. So they made a promo and they said, okay, everyone, for a limited amount of time, we want you to send us $20. We can't tell you what it's for, but it's going to be amazing. And by the way, you know, we're this is a limited time. We're not going to let you send us $20 for very long. And um, he got over like $200,000. Wow. And the plan was that they figured they'd get a couple hundred people and they were going to add their mailing address to their database and send the $20 back. So, and I may be getting the number wrong. It may have been even more than that. I mean, it was a huge amount of money. And so they, they quickly stop, stop sending us money. And they, you know, he went on the radio and he said, Look, thank you. This is great. Anyone want your money back? No questions asked. Just send us and we will send it back. And then they ended up finding two or three charities that they could give the money to. And uh, and so I thought about running an ad in the paper, um, donate to the Jesse Jackson Fund <laughs> and just push it because – Technically, I am Jesse Jackson, uh, but I never had the uh, never had the nerve. Um, I did uh, was calling a, a hotel in Austin, Texas, and I was trying to book a room. And she did say, "Don't you have someone to do this for you?" And I go, <laughs> "Well, I'm not that Jesse Jackson. I am a Jesse Jackson." So I often and and it's not as he is not as well known as he was, you know, like in the 80s and 90s. But for the longest time, I would go, hi, I'm Jesse Jackson. I look different than I do on TV. <laughs> I don't even know, is is the Jesse Jackson still with us? I believe he is. Uh, I met him once in Vegas, and I have a very... I I have a not very good photo because it was with a phone, an old version of a phone, but there is a picture of us on a casino floor with Reverend Jackson and I, and every once in a while I'll post when Jesse met Jesse. Oh, so, that's great. I am yes. so totally going to work it on the uh, the heading for this podcast saying Jesse yes. Jackson makes an appearance and, and they'll, they exactly. won't be disappointed when they see your face. They'll say, hey, what is this all about? Well, what I thought was, now I have gotten some, and especially when things are really tough politically, I do get some negative interaction on Twitter, especially where all lives matter, Reverend Jackson, and they'll, they'll, they'll push, they'll tag me and Al Sharpton on this rant that they're talking about it. Someone who's, 
who is not very happy uh, with uh, the current uh, situation. And I would always reply, you've got the wrong Jesse Jackson. I'm the one obsessed with Bruce Springsteen and Doctor Who. Um, <laughs> because at the time, those were my two main podcasts. And, uh, and, and a couple of my friends said, you know what you should do is you should take that picture of you and Reverend Jackson and put that as your profile. And then Jesse Jackson did that. Everyone would go, hey, why has the Reverend got this uh, odd white guy next to him? On Twitter. Right, right. You won't have to deal with uh, any more of that, I guess, red, right blowback anymore if you were to yes. do that. Yeah. In fact, I I changed my Twitter handle to Jesse Jackson DFW for specifically to try to get people to possibly think that I, I am not the civil rights leader. So, With that name, though, uh, I know that you're getting the, the right side energy that maybe you don't want yeah. but are you getting any left side energy that is positive um you know not normally i um i do get matt one of the you get a lot of jokes with a name like jesse jackson right and i do not mind them at all but if i'm ever irritated at a little bit is when the person makes the joke and acts like they're the first person that's ever made that joke yeah yeah that okay you know now when i i love people and they go they make a joke and they go and i guess you get that all the time yeah. and i'm like yes but that was that was a clever one or yes but you know I, I appreciate you making the attempt um the biggest downside is people tend to not forget my name and then therefore i'm in the opposite of i i may not remember their name and they always remember me they all go oh hey jesse how are you doing right. and i have to go oh hi good to meet you so yeah right i'm great with faces just not so good with names exactly right i'm the same exactly way. yes <laughs> the way that you and i first met was because i was a guest on your show and that was the only show I've ever been on. I want you to talk about that show, but that was the only show I've ever appeared on where I was given a little bit of homework in advance. And so please tell everyone a little bit about the show that you do and a little bit about your bromance and things like that. I absolutely will. Uh, I've gotten a couple of compliments. Um, in fact, just someone recently said, I really appreciate your professionalism because, you know, I, I, I do send out a zoom link and i usually include an agenda and i stress that this is just a starting point but just i want to give you an idea so the main podcast i do and i do multiple podcasts my wife would probably tell you i do too many podcasts but i do a podcast called set lusting bruce a bruce springsteen fan podcast i am about 15 20 episodes away from hitting 1000 episodes wow uh, I've been doing this since 2015, and basically what I do is I find fans of Bruce Springsteen's music or people who are fans of other musicians or people who just want to share their story, and I have them on the podcast, and we – usually about 45 minutes to an hour, and I have a – general format of give me your elevator pitch talk about growing up what kind of music did your family listen to how about once you got into high school and then if you can remember the first time you met you heard blank tell me that story and what about them spoke to you and then we'll talk about live experiences favorite albums favorite uh songs um we go through a lot of tangents if a story like Today, we're talking about bailing hail. That w was not on the agenda. If you and I discussed before, right. you know, no way bailing hay was on the uh, bingo card of this show. And then I always end every show with the Mary question. And that is uh, basically I ask my guests to go listen to the song Thunder Road from Bruce Springsteen's Born to Run album read the lyrics, and then be ready to answer the question, does Mary get in the car? 
And uh, that has become my signature ending. And whether you're a Bruce Springsteen fan or not, if you're on the show, I ask you to do that. And it's kind of puts a nice button on the podcast, similar to like you break the ice, like what have you eaten today? So my ending is, does Mary get in the car? I have to ask you, have you met Bruce himself face to face? Sort of. Um, in 2015, he put out his autobiography. Uh -huh. and, and if someone is going to correct me, I'll have the wrong year because as you get older, they all blend together. But he put oh, out an auto. Older? Yes. Okay. <laughs> he put out a autobiography. Uh -huh. and, um, and to help promote it, he did book tours. But he did not do a traditional signing. What he did is he went to bookstores. You bought a ticket, which gave you a autographed copy of the book. You stood in line, and then he met you, shook your hand. They took your picture with your phone, and they moved on. So you got like seven, eight seconds with him maybe. Um, so I did that in Austin. Uh -huh. And so I got to spend my little seven seconds with him. So I have the picture of me and my little set lusting Bruce t-shirt looking at the camera. And then the next one has me looking at Bruce that my friends say, I almost have this pathetic, that's almost pornographic look on him. Like Bruce, please do this to me. Um, <laughs> so that is the closest I've been. I um, would, obviously I would adore him to be on the podcast and, um, you know, some people with a very good heart said, well, you should have him on your thousandth episode. And I go, yeah. Do you got his name? Do you have his contact information? Right, I mean, you right. know. Yeah, let me make a call uh, or yeah. two. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. Um, one of my favorite stories, and this is not as funny as it used to be because of the uh, circumstances, but Penn Gillette told the story that at one time his mother and Bill Cosby's mom were in a senior center together and they got to be very good friends and Penn's mother called him and says you know i've been talking to blank and i can't remember bill cosby's mom's name let's just use sally right i've been talking to sally and she says you know bill's being on the tonight show really helped bill career you sh you should get on the tonight show <laughs> right it's just like, that easy thank yeah thank you mom i appreciate that no i you know so it, it's so funny when people say you know what you should do and everyone does that to you throughout your life right yes yeah so uh, I, when i was unemployed i would get people you know you should apply at sprint Sprint has a lot of call centers. Oh, I'm glad. Do you know anyone in Sprint? No. I'm like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Thanks yeah, for the exactly. information. I couldn't yeah. have thought of that myself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it'd be good. It'd be good for you to open a restaurant and get, you know, get five stars, right? That, just, <laughs> just make that happen, man. <laughs> yeah, I've never heard that one before. Yeah. <laughs> so, Jesse, being at the very top of the super fan list of Bruce Springsteen. Are you finding that there are fewer and fewer people who are aware of his music because we, you and I are of a certain age? Or are you still finding that there are just floods and waves of people who are fans? It is. There is a whole new generation, some of them because of his their parents and others who just find his music. Um, there's been a little bit of controversy this tour um, because Bruce is touring for the first time since 2016. Um, and they, there is this built in demand of people wanting to see him. I have had easy a dozen people on the podcast who've never seen him live. This is their first chance. And so there's a little bit of debate between fans who've seen him 50 plus times wanting to, well, I want this kind of set list. And then there's the fans who've never seen him go, well, I want this kind of set list. And the reality is when you've been making music since the middle seventies and over 21 studio albums, you can't do everything everyone wants to hear. But no, uh, Bruce Springsteen's fandom seems to be going strong. 
Um, I continue to be lucky enough to find guests who want to talk. Um, I just got an email the other day from someone who says, hey, I just found your podcast. I really loved it. Um, I'm sure you don't need a guest, but would you want me to join you? And I've replied back, absolutely. I'd love you to join me um, because, you know, I, I just love talking to people and I love hearing their stories uh, and whether it's about Bruce or other musicians or things they're passionate about, it's just a fun conversation. You know, when you talk about good, getting good value for your money, when you go to a Springsteen concert, like when you used to go to the Grateful Dead concert, those guys, when they get up on stage, they don't stop playing for hours. His new tour, he is playing almost the same songs every night. There's about two wild cards that he's switching out, and every other song is the same. And it's hitting about two hours and 45 minutes, which is a long show. Uh, a couple of older fans like, oh, man, he used to hit three hours. And what's going on? Well, first, he's 73. Yeah, he's getting older, too. <laughs> yes. Um, but it, he does. There is no break between songs. Uh -huh. uh, he only speaks twice. Um, and it they come out. He might say, hello, Dallas. And then they go right into a song. And when that song is ending, they are immediately starting the next song. There is maybe three to four seconds between songs versus if you think most bands will have at least 30 seconds, maybe even a minute between songs. Well, if you add he did 27 songs, even if you did, you know, a half a minute, that's another 13 or 14 minutes from beginning to end. So, they, yes. Do they take a long encore after they... Uh reintroduce themselves to come back so what is hilarious is they don't even pretend this tour okay he does the song they all applaud 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 the band all stands in the line kneels you know like bows and then they meet they don't even pretend to go off stage they just immediately go back and then that's when he'll do um okay, you know, we've got some friends here tonight from whatever food bank. He always, that is the charity he always promotes live is whatever the North Texas food bank or whatever, mm -hmm. um, you know, Ohio food bank. He's always done that. And then they immediately go into their encore, which is five or six songs. So he's coming through on this tour. We're, we're taping this show, everyone, uh, in March of 23. Yeah. Is he coming through Texas on this tour? Yes. Yeah, so um, he was here February 10th uh -huh. um, in Dallas. Uh, I went to that show with my son and uh, wife. Then in Houston, he was here February 14th. I, my wife and I went down to Houston to see him. Thursday, he was in Austin, February 16th. I went to that alone, and then we had all planned to go to Tulsa, February 21st, together. And um, Friday, I, I got up Friday morning from the show, um, drove into work from Austin, which is two, three-hour drive, worked the rest of the day, got home, did not feel good, woke up Saturday, felt really bad, tested positive for COVID. Oh, boy. So I had to miss the Tulsa show. So I got to see three of the four shows that I had planned, but I did get to see uh, th three shows in less than seven days. I got the Texas hat trick. And How many times totally have you seen him now? I am 19. That's why I would have loved Tulsa to hit the magic 20. Uh, but yes, I am at 19 and holding. Do you find that there's any jealousy between uh, your wife and you in that? You are this super fan of Bruce Springsteen, and maybe she believes he takes a little bit too much time out of your heart and soul. So, um, in fact, no, she uses it the other way. Um, it's like, great, we, Jesse's gone. <laughs> yeah, well, no, and like the other day, she loves to decorate the house for the different holidays, uh -huh. like for Thanksgiving, the fall, or Christmas. And I was just. You know, I just don't get this. And she's like, look, you love to podcast. You love to go see Bruce. Um, I love to decorate the house for these different holidays and seasons. 
Well, you see, you benefit by her decorating the house. She maybe doesn't benefit by you going yes. to all these Springsteen shows. So where's the trade-off? So one, I ended up helping fund some of the decoration. There you go. Uh, but the other thing is, um, she go she, over the past five or six years with Bruce not touring. She's done to tons of girls trips and um, doing, you know, um, going on camping trips or you know girls trips getting for the weekend and so she just and i always was like yeah go 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 with the idea that i'm pre-paying so that when bruce happens you will go okay i've had my fun now it's your turn what did she do on her girls trips where do they go what do they do they do a lot of hiking Oh, dear. And uh, yeah, I know um, <laughs> they do hiking. She used to do a lot of biking. Uh, they don't do that as much now. They love to go camping. They love to get a cabin and just, you know, do on hikes and do different things. Um, they'll do some sightseeing, but mostly they get back to nature. Uh, Linda and her sister and their other friends just are really all about their girls trips are mostly let's go spend time outside and then come back, you know, make a simple meal, have a round of drinks and just enjoy people's company. You know, in your bio, uh, there's a mention of a mixed marriage that you're involved with. So does that mean that she's not a Bruce Springsteen fan that you are? Yeah, she, she is a, she is a casual fan at best. Uh -huh. um, she she has gone to um, four shows now, and um, she 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 likes seeing him live, but she doesn't she doesn't have the obsession or passion that I do. Mm -hmm. um, but we are we have tickets to see Pink this fall. She wanted to see Pink, so I've got a tickets to go see Pink, and I'm kind of looking forward to that. I, I hear it's pretty good spectacle. Uh, I was going to ask you if you were being dragged along, uh, but now you, you just suggested that you're looking forward to it, and I bet it's yeah. going to be a pretty high-energy situation. Yeah, I, I think so, too. I think it's going to be a lot of fun, and, and I think it'll be good. Um, yeah, so we... <laughs> So here's one of my favorite stories, uh, Matthew. I We were driving in the car, and it was one of those stretch of roads where there's woods everywhere, yeah. and there's not a, a sign of civilization. And so we're driving down, and Linda says, you know what I – you know what scares me about this type of road? And I go, werewolves? She goes, no, police officers. What? Why would you think I'd say werewolves? Like, well, that's the first thing I came to. And I said, that tells you everything you need to know of our marriage. We have been married, like I said, since 84. And I still thought she might say werewolves. No, <laughs> and she's, she's like, no. The fact that she said police, is that because someone has a heavy foot, a lead foot? Or is that because she likes to party or what goes no, on just, in the car? No, just, just, <laughs> the, just the lead foot. You know, that okay. when you're driving in that, you know, straight way, it's easy to start, you know, kind of inching your way up to that higher speeds. 85 all the way. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> yes. Boy, so what other bands do you love? Or is Springsteen, I know he's at the very top for you, but what other bands do you really admire and love? So my first musical obsession, and I was a casual fan in high school, I went to high school in the 70s, and so all the 70s bands were ELO, um, you know, Foghat, Kansas, you know, uh, Barry Manilow, John Denver, Queen, Elton John, I mean, you know, this whole mixture. But the Beach Boys and Brian Wilson was my very first obsession. Right. I just adored them. Still do to this day. Um, I just talked to, um, for my thousandth episode, uh, Peter Ames Carland, who wrote Catch a Wave. Oh, yeah. Um, the mystery. He also wrote Bruce, which was a Bruce Springsteen a biography that came out before Bruce's autobiography. Um, they were my first obsession. Um, I, I love... Um, I love Bobby Darren's voice. Mm -hmm. 
And I, you know, his uh, Brad Paisley is a country artist that I really enjoy his music and his stories. And then um, John Hyatt, who is right. a singer songwriter, not as well known, but has written a lot of songs for other people. And that's my newest podcast is Sylvan Groth and I are doing perfectly good podcast john hyatt a to z and we're going through every john hyatt song in alphabetical order and wow. this week we'll finish the bees so what do you do do you play it and then do a reaction video to it or how no, does it work? We, this is mostly audio and what uh -huh. we do is we we play a little snippet of it and then we just discuss the song um for right reasons you can get a little like playing the whole song can get you a little bit. So we just kind of set the expectation of we'll play just the 30, 45 seconds of it to start. And then um, we'll go through and talk about the, the lyrics and the history of the song. And then we rank it from one to five. So those of us who are doing podcasts and radio shows, we can get away with playing copyrighted material. If it's just a little bit, as long as we refer to it. Yes, exactly. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Good it's, to know. Yeah, it, it it's and and YouTube can be very crazy. Like, um, I just recently created a promo for Set Lusting Bruce, and I used as a bed about thirty seconds of Bruce Springsteen's "Burning Train," which is from his uh, his last E Street Band album, "Letter to You," and I got notified by YouTube that Russia had blocked it that they won't play that video because there's copyright music. I guess we all have to be that much more careful nowadays when using anybody else's stuff. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I you know, just, um, anyway, yeah. So those are my big uh, musicians. I, um, I think like a lot of people my age, you get in a rut – of not exploring new music. Um, part of the problem I don't explore new music is I tend to explore a lot of podcasts, like listening to your podcast or finding other podcasts that I do take up a lot of what time I would be listening to music. Yeah. And But I just really love hearing different podcasts and different stories of other people. Yeah, I'm the same way. As I've gotten older, I've listened way less to music and way more to interesting people speak and paint pictures with their conversations and other kinds of uh, materials along those lines. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. So how many shows are you doing now? How many different podcasts? So um, I do Set Lessing Bruce, and I usually do those on Wednesday nights. I will book usually a guest at eight o'clock central time and nine o'clock central time. Um, I do um, every other week I record next stop everywhere, the doctor who podcast. Um, and I, that's with my buddy Charles and we discuss a, either a classic episode or a modern episode of doctor who the every other Wednesday I do perfectly good podcast, the John Hyatt podcast. Um, I try to like, for the sake of family unity, I try not to podcast five nights a week. Uh, so then Sunday mornings, I meet with Karen and Lou, and we are doing Last Best Hope for Conversation. Uh, it's a Babylon 5 rewatch, uh, the science fiction classic. Uh, Lou and Karen have never seen Babylon 5, so we watch it one episode at a time. I've seen the whole series, so they come in from a newbies, which is very full circle because my very first podcast experience uh, years ago was I was on a Farscape podcast, the uh, Australian science fiction show, and Lou and Karen had seen every episode and I was the newbie. And so now we've switched places where that doing that. So let's see, perfectly good podcast, next stop everywhere, set lusting Bruce, um, last best hope for conversation. And then the last one is how many, which is gives and goes. It's basically excuse for four or five of my friends we get in a room and we just pick a pop culture topic and we just talk. It's like, and we do anything like one of us got a, uh, an article of the 50 best sandwiches um, of, you know, American sandwiches or 
and so we went through each sandwich and we voted yes this is a good sandwich or no it's not but just and based then, on on the way it was described or yeah, actually and, and, okay. and if we had eaten it or not and so um and then come on we're then, all holding our breath you have to tell us what sandwich won Oh, no. What we went through is all 50 and we just kind of voted yes or no. Would that be good? And like, you know, like, um, you know, like we talked about, uh, you know, a club sandwich is something that is just I said often when we're traveling and we go to a like it's late at night and we're going to something that like an IHOP or Denny's or something that's open, I will get a club sandwich because it's just, you know, it's going to be good. You know, it's going to be consistent. So we debated on Philly cheesesteak. Uh, like one of my buddies was is a huge cowboy fan as I am, but he hates Philadelphia. So he's like, no, I'm not voting for a Philly cheesesteak. It's, it's overrated. It's not that good. And so and then. And there were other sandwiches that we had, you know, like that were very regional and we, you know, like, oh, I, I've never had that, but I'd like to try it. Yeah. The other thing is I, I don't know why a Cuban sandwich, every time I've had one, I didn't like it, but same here, everything in it sounds like it would be good, but right. yeah, I just don't know if it's just the mixture of the topics, but, and the ingredients, but I, I, I always think like, you know, I should try this again. And then I go, like, no, this isn't just my taste. As you're speaking about sandwiches in the club, which is kind of conservative and all that and delicious, I'm thinking of a big, juicy, dripping brisket sandwich that's just all over the place, you know. And so I think everyone's got their favorite styles and flavors. Oh, absolutely. And I also can think of, right, it goes back to comfort food and diner, that open face turkey, hot turkey sandwich or hot roast beef sandwich that is on the white bread. And they've got the bread with the gravy over it and mashed potatoes and like peas and carrots next to it. It just, uh, there is, there is something about that comfort, right? Oh yeah. You, I didn't realize you were just such a sci-fi geek and that you love that stuff so much. And I, yes. and I guess comic books as well. Yeah, I, I just see it. Um, my earliest memory, Matthew, is my grandmother managed a commissary, a post exchange on at Fort Polk. And a post exchange is basically if those who've never been in the army or the military is basically a target or a Walmart on the military base. Mm -hmm. So it's where you could buy, the commissary is the grocery store, but the post exchange is more like a department store. And she managed that and I would go to work with her. And I would get there and I would go to the spinner rack and I would pull every comic I wanted. I would bring it to grandma, she would rip off the cover give me the comic books without a cover and she would turn in the covers to get credit from her vendor. So she could uh, paid for it even though. The, yes, exactly. That it. way. Yeah. That way oh. I could. Yeah. And, um, how does that make sense? I, I can't quite understand that, that her yeah. giving the cover of a comic book to her vendor, how would she get paid? Cause it for was it? damaged. She couldn't ah, sell damaged. it because the comic was damaged. So got she, it. they got credit for her. Uh -huh. And, um, and, and I, you know, I guess he knew he didn't care. I mean, comics back then were 12 cents each, you know, so it wasn't like that much. Um, so those are my earliest memories of reading comic books. So I have grown up um, reading about Superman and Batman and, and uh, you know, then growing up a little bit further and doing, you know, Spider-Man and, you know, the Fantastic Four and all these. So, um, yeah, in fact, you guys can see I have a Superman poster behind me. Oh, that's a very um, cool design. Yeah, that is from Alex Ross, who is the uh, an artist, and that was from a cover of um, Superman uh, a few years ago. But gosh, probably now, probably fifteen years ago, um, where you know it was a big a novel, a graphic novel, like you know Superman tr trying to solve the world hunger problem. But yeah, it's a absolutely beautiful. Um, poster so i always have that well i like that oh getting back to uh, springsteen is he still traveling with the e street band or is it just springsteen now nope he is the e street band and he are touring this now um it, they are doing a worldwide tour uh that will 
They'll go to Europe this summer. They'll come back to the U.S. in the fall. They just performed as we're recording this. They were in Philly last night. Um, it has got the full band uh, with um, extra. They have um, they have two or three horn players. They've got two or three background singers. They've got a extra percussionist along with the core members of the band. Um, with uh so there's like 19 people on stage now when he's performing that's so like we a call it show yeah we call it the east street orchestra is uh van zandt still playing with them yes uh little steven is still playing there um he's one uh, of our favorites we we loved yeah. him on that show called uh lily hammer a few yes. years ago did you see that yes i did and you know it's funny when he he missed one of the tours because he was still filming and uh so tom morella from rage against the machine filled okay. in for him yeah uh niels lofgren is still with the band he's the one who originally took little steven's place on the east street band so now we get them both of course we lost clarence a few years ago uh jake clemens which is clarence's nephew has stepped in to play saxophone um danny federici was the um organ player he died of melanoma a few years ago so charlie gordando has taken over for organ and then roy bitten plays piano we have Mike, max weinberg on drums uh susie terrell uh plays violin and guitar uh gary talent uh plays bass and um and patty uh, has only been one show this tour and so we don't know what's going on mm -hmm. um and then all the other like i said the backup singers the band it's it's a full it is a true e street orchestra didn't max weinberg used to play with one of the late night show bands he did he was conan o'brien's band leader Right, right. I knew that name sounded familiar. Okay, I didn't realize yeah. he was still playing with them. Yeah, yeah. So he, um, yeah, he he did that, and then um, once in '99, you know, when the band got back together, um, you know, he's he's he would do double duty, and then uh, and now that Cohen, you know, no longer has the show, yeah, Max is, you know, out there beating the drums. So, of all the shows that you've been doing, which one is getting the the most? listens or views and watches and where's your demographic coming from for the most yeah. part yeah set lessing bruce is um where i get most of my downloads we get probably between four and five thousand downloads a month um That's and great, that, isn't it? yeah it really is and we've got um you know obviously a big uh us and canada um but uk and uh you know europe does okay for me um, I have, you know, it's interesting um, to pull the curtain back, right? You can, you can look at your platform that you host your podcast and it will tell you like what uh, you are and, you know, you're like, oh, you got four downloads in Chile. <laughs> like, okay, some guy in Chile is, you know, listening to this. Um, one of the things I'm really proud of is I have had people, um, I've had people from South Africa. I've had people from Australia, New Zealand, um, Germany, Russia, obviously Canada and the U.S., tons of England and Scotland and Ireland. Um, so I, you know, I haven't had anyone from the Far East yet. I would love someone from one of the Asia countries. Um, and uh, I've, you know, I've had someone who, uh, who was from Brazil, but she now lives in the U S and so, but I, I would love that. So it's, it's always interesting doing time zones as you well understand where yeah. you live, uh, you know, working with that. So um, Australia is the toughest because they're really far away. So you have to like, my morning is their evening, like the next day. Right. Like something like 18 hours difference yes. or something. Yeah, yeah, it is. Jesse, if people want to listen to your show or they want to contact you for whatever reason to listen to any of the shows, how do they do that? So I am on Twitter at Jesse Jackson DFW. My email address is setlustingbruce at gmail.com. If you go to any podcast player and type set lusting Bruce, that's S-E-T, lusting, L-U-S-T-I-N-G, 
The reason that is when Bruce performs live, when he plays something you don't expect, you start lusting, wishing you were there. So that's where the name come from. So if you go set lusting Bruce, uh, if you do Bruce Springsteen podcast on Google, I am one of them that comes up. There's like four or five now. But when I started in 2015, I was the only one. You're the king. You're the king of the Springsteen. I, I hope so. I, I sure try to. And I'm always happy to see my sibling um, partners out there. And uh, I will put a plea out to your listeners. If, if you have a favorite musician, David Bowie, Aretha Franklin, you know, Bing Crosby, doesn't matter who, uh, or a favorite band, and you want to join me to talk about it, reach out and let me know. Um, you don't have to be a fan of Bruce Springsteen to join me on the podcast. Uh, and um, we'll 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 work it out and have a great conversation and you i think you can testify that it's a fun show it was a lot of fun and so yeah friends get a hold of jesse jackson you'll get to talk music with the famous guy exactly yes <laughs> okay jesse before i let you go what's for dinner tonight um we we don't know it is my wife is following linton my son and I are not so much. Uh, so we may get Thai food and uh, to do like shrimp pad Thai. Explain uh, to me for a second before you continue. What's yeah. this whole Lent thing? Does that mean giving up stuff you love? What does uh, that yeah, mean? Well, not so, eating things that are bad? Yeah, or what, so what is that? In, in the Catholic Church, um, Ash Wednesday to Easter Sunday is a Lenten period. And it is to prepare for Easter Sunday, the re the coming back of Christ. And so traditionally, you don't eat meat on Fridays during Lent. Okay. Now, back in the day, if you were Catholic, this is before a lot of change. You never ate meat on Fridays, that Fridays was always. So traditionally, you do not eat meat on Fridays. You can, you know, fish, vegetables, but you aren't supposed to eat red meat or chicken. Gotcha. Um, and so, and then traditionally, um, what people often do during Lent is, and they that's why you'll hear giving up something for Lent. Someone will say, I'm going to give up alcohol for Lent. I'm going to give up coffee for Lent. Um, or I'm going to do something for Lent. I'm going to go to church an extra time a week, or I'm going to, you know, make an effort to connect with old friends. And this is just, it's kind of a, you know, a 40 days of kind of preparing yourself, you know, kind of almost like a spiritual fast to get ready for the Easter service. So people give up things they like for Lent. It sounds yes. like, it sounds like that's a little bit of like uh, self-imprisonment or, or torture. Yes. It's like, well, I, yeah, would, uh, I would like gear up and eat the things I love. <laughs> yes, it is. And so that's where more Mardi Gras came from is that uh, that Fat Tuesday was actually the idea you were fixed to go on this 40 day Lent. So you indulge in all the wildness on that Tuesday to try to help you get through that 40 days of uh, uh, Lent. Okay. Okay. So that's what Fat Tuesday does. Yes, exactly. Interesting. Jesse, thank you so much for coming on. We'll stay in touch. I'm a big Absolutely. fan of you and your show. And so I hope people reach out and get a hold of you. Well, I, I agree. I, I'm a big fan of you. You and I have continued to exchange emails. Um, I'm going to have you back on the podcast, and it's just it's a lot of fun. I hope continued success with the podcast and all that you're doing. Um, you're good people, as we say down south, and I am just so glad that we've been able to interact and, and continue to be friends. Fantastic. I want to say aloha to you. Have a great weekend, my friend, and we'll talk real soon. Aloha. Thanks. Good. That was perfect.